Our remaining thoughts on NFL Week 6 as we look ahead to the rest of the season. That's what we're talking about today on Road of His Overtime. It's myself, Colin Kelly. I'm joined by Sean Siegel. We did look at some of the games on our Monday episode. If you want to check that out after you finish up today, lots of good conversation in there. We had a number of other fascinating games, Sean, that you know some of the things that kind of pushed towards, yes, this is the way the season is going for these particular players and how good they have looked. Some where people maybe have potentially bounced back, the like of a, a Mark Andrews. We had a, a rookie quarterback at his first start in Drake May. Then we had Sunday Night Football where there was a, a lot of interesting things that took place in that as well. So we have a good few games to try and run through on today's episode. We also had the, the Packers getting a win over the Cardinals who, who really struggled offensively and that one how are you at the midpoint of this week as we we look back on uh what we kind of re- i wouldn't maybe reminiscent isn't the right word on the monday's episode but we were looking at it certainly with a very much a, a glass half full approach as uh it seemed like football was back the only part that i was kind of thinking i don't see this as often one of the things i i give out about after week five was the first down penalties for the finger pointing you haven't got to see the tennessee titans game yet sean will levis has sorted the problem he knows what to do he did spider-man kind of shooting you know fists up so will levis has fixed that problem for the nfl but this week it seemed to be the agenda was an eligible man downfield we had a number of plays called back for an eligible man downfield uh, with offensive linemen liking like you know maybe they were they were maybe a yard past the line on, on those occasions but how are you feeling after i just had to get it off my chest the nfl points were back exciting times it is so exciting i i don't understand why you have that penalty the limitations on offense never makes any sense but colin the big news here drake may plays and we saw both the strengths and the weaknesses. I thought through the first three quarters that there wasn't much difference between Drake May and Spencer Rattler. And then in the fourth, I mean, you you see it. Now, part of this is that they're buried at that point, and you do need to see some of these guys play when the game is on the line. We got another frantic comeback from Bo Nix and the Broncos where you're just like, you started three quarters – too late right you gotta play before you know every game. week sean every week fourth quarter we just want fourth quarter bow nicks for the whole game then like because the first three quarters tend to look pretty bleak well his teammates have done a lousy job of playing for him there colin this is a weird digression since it wasn't going to be about <laughs> bow nicks but marvin mims draws some targets and reminds you why other people are drawing targets troy Pump. franklin gets in the end zone let we'll talk about them later troy on franklin yes his hands work unlike hey. the jaguars wide receivers we'll talk about them later on as well <laughs> we might if we we might skip it if we can do it <laughs> Call this was uh, just again so exciting in the rookie 101 series i featured six guys and i mean sadly the one who has really fallen off the pace is marvin harrison and then Drake May with, you know, if you're behind Jacoby Brissett, it doesn't matter what excuses the team is throwing out there. That's a bad sign with as well as, I mean, Jane Daniels having a historic start. Caleb Williams looked fantastic in week six. He now seems like he's off to the races. He's going to be a superstar. Malik Neighbors may already be in that Justin Jefferson, Jamar Chase, CeeDee Lamb group. And then Brock Bowers may already be the number one tight end so the group is coming through right the rookie i thought you were going to say contenders. he may already be a hall of famer <laughs> so you gotta that's the one where you gotta you gotta put up the numbers right you, you need can't... to wait to week 10 at least to make that uh, proclamation <laughs> well i mean you, you just you can't be a hall of famer until you've played for a long long time that one is production based it can't be rhetoric based unfortunately because rhetoric based things are the most fun but Colin the other guy then was May Ben and I mentioned a few of the things that he brings to the table from a resume perspective in last week's uh late week stealing bananas show 
I thought you saw the whole thing here where his athleticism, you know, moving forward when there's pressure on, there's going to be pressure on. In some ways, I think for fantasy managers, that's exciting. I don't know. We didn't discuss this, I think, in part because we're in weird time zones relative to each other. We did pick up Drake May actually for our main event team yeah. as the QB2 to slide in there behind CJ Stroud. Basically, you're hoping to play Stroud every week, and yet, obviously, he has a buy on top of the other unfortunate things that potentially happen. Very excited to have that because from a fantasy perspective, Drake May is going to be everything that the enthusiasts want him to be. He's got the absolute cannon. The tricky part here is that, and his receivers are bad. This is a big game for Demario Douglas. That's probably not the direction that you need to lean as you're building the team around him. Now, this doesn't mean that, he, this, that Douglas can't be a, a fine starter for them. He can. You just need to have better players than around him as opposed to worse. There are a number of teams where I've been sort of stashing Jalen Polk for the Drake May emergence and what that might mean. You know with Polk that you have a, an extremely wide range of outcomes. One of the things we talked a lot about on Ceiling Bananas uh, with Ben having some great exposure to him as a, a Washington Huskies player is that this is a, a guy who would disappear as a college player, also someone not necessarily with bad hands because he can make the circus catches, but a lot of inconsistencies there. He has multiple bad drops in this game and ends up only catching a pass at the very end. When you're trying to put some things around Drake May and make his first start a success, give him all the weapons, you just simply have to have the guy that you've drafted in pulp to be that, to look a little bit better. Even if, again, you got a, a young guy, it's going to be developmental a little bit. But we did see a little bit from Hunter Henry. The running game was completely enveloped. Uh, Antonio Gibson, someone who had put up very good peripherals to this point. He's featured in the Zero RB universe several times as a result. He goes 13 for 19. That makes it tough, right? It puts everything on May. Probably even with the Patriots being a high caliber defense, there's just so much pressure on them that you're going to see them get beat up, eviscerated in the way that they kind of were by Houston's attack. That'll create garbage time. Garbage time is not going to be this thing that's a fantasy bounty every week, but I think you have to be encouraged. As long as Drake May survives that there are going to be a lot of points there. And again, just everything that you're looking for from the arm strength to the accuracy on some of the deep balls. That's one of the things that showed up in the numbers from last season is that a lot of his deep passes were inaccurate. There are potentially reasons for that. The intuitiveness, the mobility, the rushing yards, just simply from a fantasy perspective, he looked good, right? I mean, this, this was very exciting. Yeah, and like you mentioned there with Polk, obviously there's a couple of things in the profile that could have those concerns. The other part is it's going to take more than one week for this offense to turn around if May does do that, but there's, you know, three passing touchdowns from him this he does have the two interceptions but you, you mentioned the struggles in the run game but he leads the team in rushing five attempts for 38 yards and um, obviously didn't have Ramondre Stevenson in this one either but the the touchdown pass a 40 yard touchdown pass to to Boutte in this one was a very exciting play great ball placement lots to kind of hopefully look forward to there with Drake May moving forward they also had some challenges and this was turnovers given the Texans short fields on a number of occasions and the, the scoreline of 41 to 21 makes it seem like it's like was wide the entire game but at halftime this is 14 to 7 um you know it's just a case that they they really let it slip away in a bad way with the and they didn't actually move the ball in the first half though that no. was all at the very end with that yep. strike uh to Kayshawn which yep. you know that counts they did get completely dominated in the first half and yet because of his playmaking ability they pulled it back to a nice game there yeah, and the other part to highlight in this is Joe Mixon has been uh, missing for the Texans over the last couple of weeks. He has 13 carries for 102 yards and a touchdown in this. He also has two receptions for 30 yards and a touchdown, a nice uh, receiving touchdown there for him. But the positive in this, Sean, obviously we the negative is that Nico Collins was out. But when he has been in there, sometimes the offense has struggled to look kind of efficient as they move the ball. Now, CJ Stroud 
has 11 in completions and this one just 192 yards passing but it was positive to see tank Dell get the nine targets seven receptions 57 yards and a touchdown mm-hmm. stefan Diggs seven reset or seven targets six receptions 77 and a touchdown for him so quite concentrated around those guys now dalton schultz did get the uh eight targets leading or second in the team but he goes four for 27. i think they were looking at the dell usage the digs usage was positive and, and i thought mixon looked uh, really good in this one moving over sean to continue the rookie theme we have you know been watching Jaden daniels every week talking about the positives with him and his play again this week i thought there was a lot to be positive about from him he has the two passing touchdowns 269 yards passing i mentioned this um after the ravens beat the cowboys a couple of weeks ago but i think now lamar jackson is up to 22 and one against the nfc all opponents which is a pretty incredible number to be at he is 323 pass yards one touchdown one interception 40 yards on the ground derrick henry dominates again as derrick henry does one three two and two touchdowns for him on the ground zay flowers sean had kind of a, a career first half in this one he ends the game with nine targets nine receptions 132 for him it felt like it could even go to a, a bigger day you know at, at a half time mark andrews is the four targets three receptions 66 and a touchdown he is a 38 yard long in this one they were kind of some of the highlights you know when we look at the washington side in terms of the rush game in terms of the receiving game you know zach Ertz, noah brown are leading the way terry mclaurin does get two touchdowns which obviously is, is massive on seven targets six receptions 53 but in terms of yardage totals not a huge amount else going on there but zay flowers mark andrews moving forward here rest of the season is this just the one week for andrews can we look at him you know pushing himself back into that higher end tight end category and was there anything this week i guess that made you have any second thoughts on on daniels even though it's a loss i i was impressed by his play yeah i it's a disappointing game i think purely from a fantasy perspective because the ravens are not a complete shutdown defense through the air i do think when you're looking at a road game at the Baltimore Ravens to have played like this is just another step in a very encouraging process. The thing that we have to keep in mind here is that despite being four and two, the commanders and this shows up in the numbers you get in the, in the wrong read piece. It's pretty amusing because you look at them both uh, pass defense and rush defense. It's all green, which, means that the opposing team is off to the races for the commanders to have gone out to that four and one start with how bad their defense is it it's not just that he's playing such a fantastic quarterback position as a rookie but that it's been a one-man show in a way that you just never get in football because there are so many players involved in the game he did a lot of that again in this one. There were a few misses or he just needs teammates to come through even a little bit better. The thing that the Ravens do accomplish is to wipe out the running game without that balance. Brian Robinson obviously doesn't play in this one. Austin Eckler yeah. and Jerry McNichols had been dynamic to this point. They weren't able to do a lot in this game. They only carried the ball 11 times combined, so they weren't getting that many opportunities. But that wouldn't have been the right way to play it is to try and lean into that. When you get one-dimensional, it's going to be more difficult. This game was almost exactly what I would have expected. Daniels looked fantastic. Again, Lamar Jackson, absolutely unstoppable, averaging over 12 yards per attempt. Derek Henry, unstoppable, averaging over five yards and scoring the two touchdowns it's perhaps a bit surprising that in this game where the ravens did more or less control it but never completely gapped the commanders that you get as many passes as you get but in a game where it's still 26 passing attempts is not high volume but you get a little bit more the concentration that you're looking for here and the efficiency again off the charts but to have andrews 
I mean, just four targets. What you need from him is to be efficient. That's one of the things that has been missing. That I think has been the most surprising part of it. For Andrews not to have the targets that he needed to be a dynamic fantasy weapon, that part was almost baked in. Now, I think that the debate about that is very interesting, very fair, lots of nuance. I think the folks who expected the Ravens to take a step as a passing offense are globally correct. And so this team has been really interesting. I think they've got to be encouraged that despite the flukily bad start and despite Andrews on an individual level, not doing a ton to see what he's doing now, or to have this game coming off of, you know, what you could consider a mildly positive previous game. I think that he's going to be, if not the Mark Andrews that we've gotten used to, it's still going to be fine, right? You have the same number of targets for Isaiah likely, but you're not getting that dynamic where likely himself is the person wiping him out. You didn't get a third receiver that heavily involved. Zay Flowers looked like he was going to go over 200. So you could argue that the passing volume in the end didn't quite stack up or that the commanders made some mild adjustments. It's only a 21 point or a 22 point game in the end. It's not something that absolutely blows the doors off. And yet when you watch Zay Flowers play, and when you think about how this offense is going to continue to flow, the ability of Zay Flowers to get open, it, it's just almost unparalleled, right? And we've got a lot of stars out there. But his ability to get open at multiple levels, to get open immediately off the snap. I mean, how are you going to be a big target hog playing in an offense with Zay Flowers when he's always wide open? He's an absolute star. The question will be, you know, how many games does Derrick Henry have 20 plus carries and 150 plus yards and two or three touchdowns? That's the every, part of every game. <laughs> I mean, maybe so, maybe so, but you have to work through it and you have to understand that if you have a game where Lamar Jackson is going to look unstoppable as a passer and Derrick Henry is going to look unstoppable as a runner, that game is going to be against the Washington commander's defense that is playing with like nine or 10 guys <laughs> in terms of how their overall ability translates through i thought there was a chance that the commanders could pull this one off going in i like the way that they played this is maybe the archetypal example though of a game playing exactly to script and not a lot of surprises in this one i think both teams have to be encouraged let's talk about some of the teams in the nfc north um, in terms of how this division is going to go forward. We talked about the Lions on the, the Monday episode. Obviously, the Vikings on a bye. The Bears, they travel to London. They get a, a win over the Jacksonville Jaguars, 35-16 to 16 in this one. The Jaguars, I don't know. Trevor Lawrence has had his issues, but the, the Jaguars dropped four potential touch. And when I say potential, I mean touchdown passes in this one where you know they, they don't make the play. He ends up having two touchdown passes to Gabe Davis in this one. He, but the, I guess the the star performer in terms of the Jaguars was Evan Ingram. He has ten targets, ten receptions for 102 yards. On the other side, though, Sean, a fantasy kind of explosion from the Chicago Bears, who go to four and two on the season. Caleb Williams just has uh, six incompletions in this game, 23 out of 29, two two six, four touchdowns, one interception. DeAndre Swift has 17 carries, 91, and a rushing touchdown for him. He leads the backfield quite comfortably. We do get 56 rushing yards for Williams on four carries as well. Cole Komet gets two touchdowns. Keenan Allen gets two touchdowns, both of them with five receptions in the game on five targets. So it was a very efficient day from those two particular players. Again, some highlight plays from the rest of the, the offense. Swift getting four receptions for 28 yards to go with the rest of his day quiet though around the rest of the offense so i guess the rookie quarterback play is the first thing to touch on the other part i guess etn goes out with an injury and this is going to be week to week for him bigsby only had seven carries for 24 yards but etn when he went out had three carries for minus one yard and this particular one that backfield bigsby has a chance now to to wrestle a little bit of a hold on it sean do you remember in the off season when we were drafting and there was concern around Cole Komet versus 
Gerald Everett. That feels like a long time ago. Um, but in terms of Williams and how he has been able to elevate this offense over the last couple of weeks, my question to you is, is that that he's a rookie quarterback that's helping this team develop? Or is it that the last three opponents that they have had have been Carolina, the Rams, and the Jaguars, who are three of the easiest matchups defensively in the NFL? The good news for them is that they have a bye week this week. Their next three opponents are the Washington Commanders, the Arizona Cardinals, and the New England Patriots. So they've basically faced the bottom three defenses, and now they go to the 28th, then the 27th, and the 25th. So uh, even if they are just doing well against bad offenses, uh, maybe this is a case where a few years ago um, we had the situation where we're like looking at some of the strength of schedule stuff, and you know you can see where the players are going. Is this the ultimate strength of schedule for an offense to face these six teams in a row? It's a fun stretch. I think that because of any given Sunday and because NFL teams broadly are good and are populated with NFL players, it is possible to lose track. And then you have certainly individual defensive metrics that aren't that sticky. You have individual defensive injuries that very swiftly change what a unit can do. And, you know, that as we mentioned yesterday uh, was one of the heartbreaking things there with Aiden Hutchinson and the lions. But I do think it's extremely valuable. And we've had a lot of success when you look at the strength of schedule streamer on the site. And certainly when you look at a chunk of the season, you pick out the different position that you are interested in. You see those, you know, top two or three teams and the bottom two or three teams. And whereas there's going to be, a lot that can happen in the broad middle and the individual skill level of the players on offense (laughs) is going to make a huge difference. But the teams with the very easiest schedules and the very hardest schedules are almost like they're playing in two different leagues. You do see a big schedule strength element to the production (laughs) that you get from these teams. So the thing that you have to do when you go through the easy stretches is you have to take advantage And Caleb Williams has done that. He now looks very, very good. Shane Waldron (laughs) still, I think, remains very controversial. But since the team meeting, since the DeAndre Swift revenge tour, they've started to score. Now, again, what you pointed out is that a lot of this is because you're playing the weakest teams. And Williams, with that extraordinary arm talent, has been making plays that don't seem possible as he's played poorly. In this game, he puts up big fantasy numbers. He gets the easy win. He does probably have his worst throw or one of his worst throws where you look at DJ Moore, the five targets, the four for 20. With all of the weapons they have, it's going to be frustrating to play these guys because if you had DJ Moore out a week ago when he blew up for the two touchdowns that would have been frustrating obviously you put him back in the lineup because he scored and then he does this and you know he also got tackled at the one as well which ended up being DeAndre Swift's rushing touchdown so yeah and that part that part you don't like unless you got a lot of DeAndre Swift but he was open behind the defense in this one and Williams maybe it's just a bad throw. Maybe you thought he had more time. Maybe you thought he had more so wide open. They didn't want to blow it, but we've watched him rip off throws that seem impossible. This was one where he floated up there. Like he had no arm strength or no confidence in it. It does get picked. That is his interception against the four touchdowns. That's not the story, but there are still some things that they can do even better. Colin, this was a game that actually played very much to the script. We were talking about in the preseason where when you have the three, wide receivers it can be tough that's something that i profiled uh, looking at jsn and the potential for a leap and where he might fit in was just how difficult it is contextually if you're in these three receiver groups and what that meant for him last year what it could mean looking forward but also that's very relevant to as we think about the bears so you look at the adp and you're thinking the most expensive player is tough in these groups because you're priced up despite the potential restrictions the cheapest player may be tough in a doomsday because 
you're on the outside looking into the volume that you need potentially. Now, late in the offseason with Keenan Allen having the injury, which has turned out to be a very real thing, right? He's barely played. He falls down to third. But if you have a veteran who is arguably underpriced to what he's done, not just overall, but very recently, maybe you could take advantage of that. Maybe you could take advantage of Cole Komet, who, again, is just one of the best tight ends in the NFL. Now, Komet is going to continue to be difficult to play. Allen is going to continue to be difficult to play. All of these guys are tough. I think that we could see still an emergence from a Dunze if he is what people want him to be. But I don't think it's going to be definitive either direction. He could still eventually be that guy, even if 2024 ends up being frustrating all the way through. Now, the thing that is so encouraging here is that this is a large pie game. But even in a large pie game, you don't get anything or anything that's playable from a Dunze and more. It's going to be tough, right? It's going to be very tough. I do think the one thing with the Komet play is, you know, tight end, there is a limited amount of options, and he is somebody who is capable of these sort of spike weeks. So I have him in quite a bit of dynasty leagues, and I, when I look at the other names that are sprinkled in there, he's certainly still going to have to be uh, added into the lineups. But moving on, Sean, to the other team. Oh, Colin, uh, the th- other thing there you mentioned, the bad drops – Brian Thomas has oh, yeah. looked really good this season, but has a brutal drop in the end zone. He also has a vertical sideline route where he gets open behind the defense and at the very least into a window there could have been a huge play. Trevor Lawrence underthrows him. That I think is frustrating to them both because arm strength is not the issue for Trevor Lawrence, right? So those two plays are frustrating. If you had Brian Thomas in, the three for 27 dramatically understates what his week should have been. And it was on both him and Trevor Lawrence that they fell short there. The Jaguars are one in five. They get blown out by the bears. There are so many pieces of information that we don't have that you can't in any way fairly evaluate. And yet with the Jaguars being one in five with the defense and tatters with the offense running some things, schematically that a lot of analysts don't like for 2024 not taking advantage of some of the elements that have allowed teams to be successful and then you have a game like this where i think it's very frustrating if you are a travis etn fan or if you're travis etn himself and you're probably one of the seven or eight best running backs in football but yet you have a talented backup so you're losing some time and you're also injured. But from a fantasy perspective, people are thinking, well, how is this going to play out now? Then ETN goes out and people are thinking, okay, well, we're going to get Tank Bigsby unleashed, but they go to Ernest Johnson instead. Now, in fairness, Ernest Johnson is actually a pretty decent depth running back. If you have him on your roster as an NFL team, as the RB3, that position is built nicely. It gives you flexibility. But one of the reasons people were excited about Bigsby coming in is that he had done some, I would call them under the radar, but he had been a a viable receiver in college. And it's that three down profile that you like one of the red flags for him as a rookie. And then one of the red flags for him, even after week five, where his evasion numbers are off the charts and he looks unstoppable is the inclusion or lack thereof in the receiving game. I mean, what are we doing here, right? We're a year and a half into his NFL career. He's a dynamic player. He should be involved in this game. For Travis Etienne to go out and for it not to unlock Bigsby, but instead just make it so the third stringer has extended run, the coaching staff doesn't seem prepared for these games. That's another element here when you're thinking about how much longer does Doug Peterson have. I would suggest that it may only be until they get back to the u.s yeah so they're staying in london for week seven uh back-to-back games in london yeah if they lose that one i think there's and they are playing the patriots in that one out of big concerns that that london course for head coaches could strike again sean i'm going to go rapid fire through a couple of uh, kind of talking points i'll let you head on what you want then before we finish up today's show the packers get a win against the cardinals the cardinals really struggled and this one kyler murray struggled again this was one where marvin harrison goes out early to a concussion he had two targets at that point 
Trey McBride has eight targets, eight receptions, 96 yards. He is basically the majority of this offense. James Conner struggled in this one running the ball. Um, the entire team really struggled. I find with the Cardinals, if them, you know, can force 15 kind of plays, the scripted plays don't go well. They do tend to struggle moving forward. They turn the ball over three times through fumbles. You had James Conner, Murray, and Greg Dortch all losing fumbles. That gave the Packers some short field position. Jordan Love has four passing touchdowns, one interception in this one. 258 passing yards. The one thing, again, you know, I'm going to hype up Love, but the aggressiveness that they show offensively, I think some of that is down to the offensive play design, but there's also like the the deep touchdown to Romeo Dobbs was deep for Dobbs, 20 yards. Uh, but, you know, putting the ball down the field in situations where I think other quarterbacks are probably throwing the ball away, but he's trying to give the offensive players a chance to make those plays at, at every opportunity. We get a touchdown for Jaden Reed again here. I say again, it seems to be every week, but he gets six targets, six receptions, 28 and a touchdown did miss time through injury so limited a little bit from that perspective but Dobbs gets in the end zone twice and I mentioned uh you know the deep plays he gets the deep play as well to Christian Watson for a touchdown three for 68 for him and a touchdown I think uh, just the aggressive nature of the the overall game plan worked out in this one so they win that one pretty easy Dontavian Wicks just the three targets one reception for nine yards Tucker Craft who I was expecting with um uh, his running made a tight end Musgrave going on injured reserve I was expecting him to be involved more four targets two receptions 13 yards again the Packers were in control kind of throughout this one might have been just kind of game dependent you mentioned Bo Nix we talked about some of the things there we do get uh Cortland Sutton with a touchdown what an absolutely spectacular catch it was called a touchdown on the field Maybe the ball moved, maybe it didn't. I think the effort level there was spectacular. He does get in the end zone on that 20-yard touchdown, 53 yards and four receptions. Troy Franklin gets in the end zone at the back of the end zone, three targets, two receptions, 31 for him. The running backs struggled a little bit in this one. We have Javante Williams with a fumble. Bo Nix led the team in rushing six for 61 for him. He has two touchdowns, one interception, 216 passing yards. He... Again, as we mentioned, you know, 16 points for them put up in the fourth quarter. So they had no offensive scores through those first three quarters. It finishes 23 to 16. On the other side, J.K. Dobbins, I was interested to see what would happen post their bye week because it kind of looked like he made it slow down a little bit week three, week four. But he has 25 carries here, 96 yards and a touchdown for him. And this one, we do get Kamami Vidal involved as well. Just four for 11 on the ground, but he does have a 38-yard receiving touchdown, two for 40, and a touchdown for him, which is pretty cool to see. That is the Broncos and the Chargers. And then the last one I wanted to mention was Tyrone Tracy. He has 17 carries for 50 yards and a touchdown in the absence of Devin Singletary, but he really was super impressive in the receiving game. Six targets, six receptions for 57. A major part of that offense, we got... Darius Slayton, six for 57 again this week. And we get Wondell Robinson with a short area target, Sean, 11 targets, five receptions for 50 for him. I thought this was one of T. Higgins' best performances over a long stretch of time. You know, very strong at the catch point, strong through contact, seven targets, seven receptions for 57. And the other notes, Chase Brown does have a 30 yard rushing touchdown in this he leads the backfield now obviously that 30 yard one rush helps a lot but he had 10 for 53 zach moss was six for 13 in terms of that backfield so i think chase brown is looking more and more like he should be leading it moving forward the the interest in early playing this sean joe burrow as we would expect takes off for a 47 yard touchdown run uh but he he did struggle against this Giants defense outside of that and I think a lot of people will be 17 to 7 the final score went through a lot there Sean rapid fire hit me with whatever thoughts you have on those three games or any of the players involved well Tyrone Tracy absolute star he looks so good he was one of our absolute favorite guys from the road of his rookie guide road of his rookie guide players had a big week so that part was always fun. We have a great time putting that exercise together with all of those advanced college stats. His 17 for 50 as a rusher really, I think, gives a false impression of what he did 
on a lot of those carries where he's consistently converting uh, difficult third and one, fourth and one, all of those types of plays, electric as a receiver. Sometimes these guys who are position change players actually don't look that comfortable as receivers. That's one of the reasons they were moved off of receiver. He looks so fluid in every aspect. Yeah, I did take a note on him on the touchdown drive that he had. It was a 16 play drive. He had nine of the touchdowns in those 16 plays. And they went for uh, fourth, fourth down quite a bit in this game. But on that particular drive, Tracy was the play on two of those fourth down plays. So he was heavily involved in key situations. I thought he looked really good. Sean, as we get ready to close it up, any other final thoughts on week six? I would like Jaden Reed to not be out there returning kicks. He took a pretty vicious hit that I do think resulted in an injury yep. on that. The Cleveland Browns Philadelphia Eagles game had maybe more humor than true NFL performance. Trey McBride. AJ Bryan with a big man touchdown. Big boy he's, catch. He's a good big player. I thought you were going to mention Devontae Smith has the long score. I mean, Devontae does, yeah. is the guy. The I mentioned the wrong read a couple of times. The funny part there, uh, we talked about how Ravens playing commanders. It's all green. It's off to the races. Broncos, Chargers, it's all red everywhere. You've got two strong defenses. You have very limited offenses. Within that context, I thought both QBs played well. Bo Nix battling at the end and ending up with a very fine fantasy day. That part, I think, encouraging. You mentioned the Cortland Sutton play. I'm not a huge Cortland Sutton fan. I did think it was a catch, right? The ball moves, but it's one of those where his hand is stuck to it the whole way. Those have been called touchdowns this year, which I like as someone who's a fan of scoring. We like Certainly, I would understand anybody who thinks it's not a catch, but that's the way that play has been called. And so it made sense for that to hold up. As we mentioned, such a fun week of fantasy. Yeah, fun week. Hopefully week seven follows in its footsteps. We will be back with one more show later this week on the Friday edition of Rotoviz Overtime. Make sure you are subscribed to the Rotoviz Overtime podcast feed to get those once they are available. I haven't plugged it in a few weeks, Sean, but you can if you are signing up over at rotoviz.com to get access to all the content and the tools, Sean's articles, the wrong read from Blair, all the other aspects of the website. You can use the code RVRADIO2024 at checkout to get yourself a 10% discount off a Rotoviz NFL pass. If you haven't signed up or if you are renewing, no better time to do it. Get yourself in. Make sure you get in and get that win in NFL week seven to push you towards the playoffs my name is colin kelly you can follow me on twitter at over to marlin my co-host is sean siegel check out all of his work up on rotaviz.com until we are back have a good one